guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter, and today I'm here with a very exciting video because we're gonna go back in time and revisit my very first restoration project on this YouTube channel. So over here I have my 1934-ish Royal KHM typewriter. This is Edgar. He's one of the first typewriters I ever had in my collection. When I started collecting typewriters, I told my grandparents and they said, I think we have one in the basement. If you can find it and haul it out of there, you're welcome to have it. And so I went on a hunt to find this typewriter and now he's in my collection. It's one of the first projects I ever actually tackled as far as typewriter repairs because when I got it, it wasn't in the world's greatest condition. So today I want to go back and rewatch my first restoration video because there's a lot of things that I know a lot better now than I did then when I started. So let's go back in time and rewatch my very first restoration video, restoring my Royal KHM. All right, here goes nothing. Let's go back in time. Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My oh Typewriter, my and today I'm here with an ancient, old, and decrepit royal typewriter that is in desperate need of a clean and some fixin'. Right off the bat, let's just talk about some of the elephants in the room, shall we? Why am I in front of a bright yellow background? This is actually my parents' basement in this footage. You can see here these, like, curtains. We took those out of the theater when they redid the theater at our high school and we used those for soundproofing. For some reason I was like this would be the greatest shot. I'm not going to be front lit at all. I'm going to light from above and be in front of this bright yellow curtain. It's so cinematic. Awful. <laughs> now my grandfather actually owned this typewriter and I found it in my grandparents basement. He carried it from his dorm room to class every single day which is quite a feat because it weighs like 45 pounds. He told me that he had carried it from class every I do not believe that. Um, but it is still very hefty, and I do not want to diminish how heavy of a machine it is and how difficult it actually was to find when I first found it. So that clip of me in the basement pulling it out from underneath that workbench, I actually went on an expedition to find this typewriter in my grandparents' house. They didn't know where it was, so I had to go looking for it. Um, and I looked all over the basement, and finally I saw, out of the corner of my eye, it was covered with a typewriter cover that did not belong to it. But out of the corner of my eye, I did see like a corner and something covered underneath this workbench in the one room far off into the corner. So I decided to look there and that's what it was, but it took me like a couple hours to find it in their basement. And that clip of me lifting it off the floor onto the chair, it was so heavy, I almost dropped it. I was so surprised by how heavy it was because it was one of the first typewriters I'd actually ever encountered. I was not prepared for the weight of that machine. Since then I've done some typewriter lifting and I'm much better prepared, but I was shocked and I almost dropped it. It is at this point that we now realize I have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> Correct. I still have no clue what I'm talking about. Because the simple cleaning process took about a week's worth of restoration. So I talk about how this one day cleaning project turned into a week's worth of restoration. That is very typical of how my typewriter projects go. I usually start over ambitiously thinking that I can do it, but when I started on this project, I had never worked on a typewriter before, so I didn't know the terminology for how to even Google what was wrong with it. I didn't have any resources as far as where do I go when I don't know how something works. I didn't have any typewriter maintenance friends at the time. I didn't even know that Phoenix Typewriter existed where I could go in and Google my problems and find a video that he had done on them. So I was kind of just out there swimming a little bit not knowing what was gonna happen, and that's why it took me so long to do some of these more simple repairs, but a lot of my projects turn out that way, and every machine you do is going to teach you something new so you can tackle your next project. The carriage didn't advance past a certain point, the platen was lumpy, and the feet were rather squished, which is an issue due to the suspension mechanism underneath the machine. So here I talk about how the squished feet can cause suspension issues. If you're interested in learning more about typewriter feet, Yes, typewriter feet. I do a video on that actually because, what are you doing? Diamond got a hold of the battery box. What are you doing? So if you are interested in learning more about typewriter feet, I do have a repair video on that that I did earlier this year. I'll link that down below, but you can check out a little bit more information. Typewriter feet actually buffer your typewriter and it, it keeps it off the ground a little bit. So it's allowed to move more smoothly in those under linkage areas. So they're incredibly useful on a typewriter and you should definitely have them. Oh my God, stop it. Diamond, no. Okay, battery crisis averted. We started by taking the machine apart. I removed the ribbon and top cover. After this, we were able to determine that some of the bars inside the typewriter attached to the keys were bent. We managed to bend some of these back in place. 
We also found that some of the S-shaped hooks that attach the keys to the moving spring-loaded bars inside were missing on the zero and three keys. What I'm talking about here is some of the type slugs would not actually go up and type on the platen. And what we discovered was that the linkages underneath were actually bent in a couple places, so they were rubbing up against each other. We did have to bend some of those back so they were in a straight location. And we also determined that some of the linkage pieces, linkage pieces were actually missing. So there's these S-shaped hooks that link your type bars or your type slugs to the next linkage piece in your machine. And we had a couple of those missing. Now we were able to find one, I think. Let's see. We found one and managed to fish it out. The other eluded us until we aired out the typewriter and it fell out. Had I not found that piece and not known about those collector groups, it would have taken me a really long time to figure it out. But there are resources available out there for you to find pieces on a typewriter if you're attempting a restoration. So I'll link below my sourcing parts video so you can check that out. There's some other great resources out there. And if you're a first time restorer like I was in this video, you might not know they exist. So they're out there and I found them for you. We removed the front panel and use penetrating oil to loosen up the other keys and remove any rust. We were using a brake cleaning penetrating oil and what it does is it sits on the dirt and the dust and it eats away at that so that you can go in later with a cleaning solution and clean that off. Would I use penetrating oil now? I have on some tougher typewriters, including my Royal 10 Monster, but when I started, we just used this because we didn't know what other resources were out there. If I were to attempt this project again, I would definitely probably start with mineral spirits instead of penetrating oil because it wasn't as dirty and locked up as something that would require penetrating oil, and it probably could have been cleaned quicker and easier with mineral spirits than that oil itself. An oil like that is hard to remove. It can get sticky on the surface of parts if not removed properly. And what that does is it'll attract dust and dirt back to those pieces, which is what we want to avoid. We then let this sit overnight and prep for some more cleaning the next day. <laughs> on to day two. On day two, we removed the other panels and then took the typewriter outside. I don't know if I talk about it here, but in this shot where I'm overhead taking out the panels, while I was working on this, and in the beginning I talked about how I couldn't get the carriage to move past a certain point, it wasn't just the margins, which is what that shot showed. Inside was actually a piece of a twig that got stuck between the margin like stopper and the edge of the carriage. And while I was taking off these back panels, the twig, I saw it for the first time and I had to pry it out with pliers, but there was actually a little twig in there stopping the margin from actually moving over at all. And I don't know if I talk about that here, but that was like one of the first weird things I found in a typewriter was a twig because I have no idea how it got in there. It was in a basement for like 50 years. So I have no idea where that twig came from. Using an air compressor, we removed dust and grime and the occasional cobweb from inside the typewriter. We then used brake cleaning fluid to remove the penetrating oil residue. Okay, so here I talk about using brake cleaning fluid to remove the residue from the penetrating oil, which is what you should do. You should use some kind of cleaner to get that oil off of there. In this case, we use brake cleaning fluid. Again, I've used that on typewriters and it does air out using an air compressor, but Nowadays, I would probably use mineral spirits instead because I buy industrial sizes of mineral spirits to use on typewriters. And also it's just something that I know is tried and true on typewriter internal pieces and that's probably what I would go with nowadays. After that, we use the air compressor to quickly evaporate the fluid, which left the machine mostly void of grime. This is where we found our missing S-shaped okay, piece. Okay, yeah, so we talk about how we found that missing S-shaped piece there. We were just blowing it out with that air compressor and it flew out of the machine and I had to go find it and I used a magnet on the driveway to find it because it was blending in. It was a whole process. We then took the typewriter inside and attempted to rehook the X key and using the S-shaped keys, the zero and three. <laughs> We had trouble managing to fish the hooks into some of the holes on the keys because they required us to bend the spring-loaded mechanisms. We then found that the most effective way to get the hooks back on was to remove the wire holding all the keys in place to the key that we needed to reattach, loop the hook back in, and then reposition the key. Okay, so I do not know terminology at this time in history, so I didn't know how to properly describe what was happening. So what was happening was some of my type slugs were not working at all, and that was because they were missing that S-shaped hook that links them to the linkage that connects the actual typewriter key to your typewriter slug. And what we did find were some of those S-shaped hooks, we were able to reattach some of those. Some of the linkages underneath were bent, so we did straighten those out. But what we had trouble with was reattaching the type slug or the metal piece with the letter on it 
to that linkage using that S-shaped hook. And we were trying to like maneuver it in there, but it was requiring us to like bend some of those pieces back because we were linking two things that were already in place. What we learned was that we could remove that wire that is in there linking all of the type slugs into the type basket. We could just push it out of the way a little bit, loosen up that type slug, pull it out of its slot, reattach it, and then put that type slug back into the carriage basket and then hook it back in with that wire, which is what I did on my Royal 10 project as well. And that's how I learned how to do that. But when we were just starting, we had no idea that that was the proper way to do that. In fact, we spent hours and hours and hours trying to just like finagle them in there and fish them in there before removing that wire. And we got into a large argument over it and we both got frustrated. Um, so it was like this huge ordeal that it would never be nowadays because I know how to do that thing. But every project is going to teach you something new. And that is how I attempted to remove all of the type slugs on my Royal 10 project. I just removed that wire. It was so much easier. So I'll link that video down below as well. We did a quick WD-40 cleaning of all pieces and then let it rest. I wonder if anybody roasted me in the comments for using WD-40 to clean it. I would never do that now. We use WD-40 to clean some of these panels. And as you can see, they're actually kind of shiny, which is nice. Um, but we use that because we didn't know what other cleaning resources were out there to clean metal pieces on typewriters. So we use that because it would grip some of that dust and dirt. And because I was wiping it off, it wasn't leaving any residue on the machine so it wouldn't like attract dust to the outside of it at a later time. But I would never do that nowadays because people get really upset when you use WD-40 anywhere near a typewriter for a couple of reasons. Because most of the time when you're spraying WD-40, you're using it as some kind of lubricant on metal. Because metal pieces, when they're rubbing against each other in any fashion, whether it's a door hinge or a typewriter piece, and they get squeaky, it's because they're causing friction between two pieces of metal. So you add something like WD-40 to add a little bit of a buffer and a barrier and a lubricant to those metal pieces. But people don't usually remove WD-40 once they've sprayed it. Once they've sprayed it, it acts as that lubricant on that door hinge and now it no longer squeaks and it works and you just kind of leave it there and you don't think about removing it. On a typewriter, leaving that on that metal surface will attract dust and dirt and it'll collect in different areas on your machine. And when you're in a precision instrument like a typewriter, dust and dirt can really affect the performance over time. So typewriter collectors tell you never to use WD-40 on your typewriter because if you spray it and leave it on there for forever, it'll attract so much dust and dirt and it just ruins the typewriter over time. Nowadays, I would clean the outside of this machine with my favorite cleaner, Simple Green. Not sponsored, I just love to talk about it. So if you wanna see a little bit about cleaning the exterior of a typewriter, I'll also include a link to my Simple Green Clean video. And that's how nowadays I would clean the exterior of this machine. I also notice, and I think I say this later, I talk about buffing the machine. When I would buff this machine, and I don't think I actually did that. I think I said I buffed it because that's what I thought I was doing, but I think I was really just using a microfiber cloth on it. If you want to see how to buff clean your typewriter so a surface isn't very shiny and you want to use some kind of polisher on it, I do have a video and I will link that down below where I was restoring my first Royal 10, not my monster. I'll link that down below, but I use a very specific polish. I think it's like number seven or number nine. And what you do is you wet a cloth, you get some polish on there and you rub it onto the typewriter and then wipe it away. And that does polish up the surface of your typewriter. And if I were going to polish surfaces, that's how I would do that now. Not so sure I did that then. At this point, we weren't really sure what model of typewriter this was. Using my CSI skills, I tried to match the general shape of my typewriter to the ones I found on the internet. Initially, I thought it was a Royal KHM. This would have been made in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and was popular as a wartime typewriter. This led us to a War Department typewriter cleaning manual, which proved useful when we took apart the platen roller and carriage return later on in this process. So here I'm referencing a wartime maintenance manual for typewriters, and I've used this manual several times since this repair job. I will link a PDF of this down below because it's so helpful when you're taking apart a typewriter and you kind of don't know what you're doing. It's very helpful to have diagrams of the different mechanisms on your machine. Even if you don't know what some of the levers on top do, because I still don't, Finding a manual for that typewriter can actually show you what those things do or what they're supposed to do. So when I found this manual, it had directions for how to take off the carriage of your typewriter or remove the platen. I had never removed a platen, I think, before working on this machine. So this was the first platen removal I had ever done. 
and it doesn't have an easy removable platen because that would have been nice. But uh, having a manual like this was so helpful for this process because it explains what every single piece is in every part and it'll show you what it's supposed to look like. This is from the war department, the military department, some kind of military agency, because when you would take your typewriter with you to war, they're not typewriter repair techs. So you kind of had to learn how to do maintenance on your own machine. And they break it down into really easy to understand diagrams and steps for how to do some of those things. So I highly suggest if you don't already have like a typewriter repair Bible, finding some of these older manuals can be really helpful when you're approaching some kind of typewriter repair. While it matched via photo, there were some pieces that didn't match the descriptions I found on these machines. Mainly, our typewriter had its original clear glass panels, while KHMs had standard plastic insert panels. Okay, so what we're gonna do is here, I talk about how I'm not really sure what kind of typewriter this is because it looks like a KHM which is what it is. And this was also before I like really knew how to use the serial database and I was just kind of confused on how it worked. So we're gonna take the serial number now and try using it in the database just to double check and confirm that I know what I'm talking about, which I don't. So we're going into the serial database and what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter Royal into this top box and what it's going to do is bring up a database, ha, huh, of all of the Royal models and Royal standard models, which this is a standard model because it's for a desk, it's a desk standard. And it'll bring up a bunch of different numbers on here. The first column is a serial number. The second column is a year. The third column is like a picture of what that standard manual looks like or that typewriter looks like. And then you'll have some notes about what it is or differences between models and makes in that next column. So. My typewriter is 1688. Yeah, so it would have been right in here. So I scrolled down, I said, okay, well, it's not a Royal 10, let's go after that. And I looked for numbers that kind of match mine. Mine is 1668. Now they don't have a listing directly for 166, but they do have a listing for 161. And then the next listing they have, which is the next year, 1935, they have a listing for 172. So I know that my number is right in between those, so I can guesstimate that my typewriter is from 1934. Now in this remarks column, they have a note about the H designation in front of my serial number. So my serial number and the reason I got confused was because there was this H number and H, it's a letter, not a number. There was this H in front of it. So I was confused as to what that meant. But here in the remarks column, it says H and KH in the 16.6 to 18.5. Um, so that was just like a designation and model of that machine to designate that this is a KH M model or is it because KMH runs from 185 to 22 why is mine different so what this would indicate is that it's an H model this is why I was so confused before and I just convinced myself I knew what I was talking about Royal H typewriters. But they have these tablatures in the front. Oh, mine has that. So it's a KH, which is what I said it is in the video. I thought I was like doing some real investigative work. I was like, I was so silly back then and didn't know how to use the serial database. And now I know how to use the serial database. Clearly, I still don't know how to use the serial database. Okay, now we're going into the platen repair. And this is something I still haven't had to do in anything else. So this is the only tutorial I have on it. We did some preliminary research and found that replacements were too expensive, especially since they weren't really being made anymore. We decided to sand down our platen until it was even on all sides and then build it back up to height using plastic mechanical shrimp grab. So that was rather quick to describe what we did. So over time, bumps happen in your platen. When water can get into the wood part of your platen, make it crack and bubble up. Sometimes if you leave the rollers engaged all the time on the platen, they can create flat spots on your platen. Over time, the rubber just itself gets eroded and it can turn into bumps. I always tell you to look for a lumpy platen on your typewriter because it's an expensive fix if you send it off to get it done by someone else. And there are people who resurface platens if that's something you need. 
what we decided to do was actually take the platen out of the machine and sand down those bumps so we had a flat, smooth surface across the entire typewriter. Bumps in a platen will cause it not to roll paper through consistently. It just will grip the paper in different spots and it won't roll paper through nicely. So by sanding down all those bumps, we made it so the entire platen was smooth across the surface. However, by sanding down those bumps, we had actually created too much space between the feed rollers underneath the platen and the edge of the platen itself. So now paper wouldn't be gripped at all. So we had to build up back that height on the platen of rubber. So we took this like shrink wrap mechanism or shrink wrap tubing, placed it over the platen and used a heat gun to melt that shrink wrap to the platen to build it back up to the proper height so that now paper can be gripped by both the rollers underneath the platen and the platen itself at the same time and smoothly roll that paper through the machine and you can type on it and it'll actually grip the paper and work like a typewriter should work. Let's see what the comments are in this video. Here, okay, I thought I was gonna get so grilled on this because typewriter collectors hate WD-40 and I get it. So someone commented, what a wonderful machine. I hope you reserve the WD-40 for cleaning panels only. It causes more problems due to gumming or getting dust in the machine. Um, and they talk about their collection a little bit. I thought I would get so destroyed for using WD-40, but I think that's like the only comment on it about WD-40, so that's good. Uh, if I would post that now, people would be mad at me. <laughs> oh, here's one from Thrifty Fawn, who's been watching all my videos. Um, she says, special thank you to Sarah's dad for providing support and contributing to this excellent content. Yes, we need to make sure we thank my dad. He is very helpful in all of these processes. Every typewriter I tackle, especially these bigger ones, I always need my dad's help because he is a mechanic and if he doesn't know how to do it, he can usually look at something and figure out how it works. He just has the mind for that. So he was incredibly helpful for learning how to do my first restoration and all of my restoration projects since. Okay, so that was kind of cute. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Wasn't as cringy as I thought it was going to be, which is good, but that was my first restoration project. I have learned so much about typewriters since tackling that first project. In fact, when I tackled that project, I maybe had four typewriters. I had Caroline, my Smith Corona Corsair Deluxe. I had Jan, the Electric Sears Celebrity 12. I had this typewriter, which is the Royal H model, and I had an Electra 120, which was also my grandparents' typewriter. They found both typewriters and I was allowed to have both of those typewriters. So at the time I only had four typewriters. I had never done a restoration project before beyond like a little bit of cleaning on the electric typewriter. It is so funny to go back now and watch what I did then. As far as tips and advice I gave in that video, it's not terrible, but there's some better cleaning products for some of the tasks that I did in that. When you're cleaning internal pieces on a typewriter, I now suggest mineral spirits. It's a paint thinner. Um, it's a little bit more accessible than things like penetrating oil and brake cleaning fluid, which you might not have if you're not a mechanic. Mineral spirits has more general purposes, and that's a great way to clean out gunk, dirt, and grime on your typewriter. Always do it in a ventilated area. You do not want to be huffing that stuff. <laughs> and you always want to make sure that you also clean it out of your machine appropriately, which is why I use an air compressor after using mineral spirits. Um, you can use other things like compressed air would also work on that, like the cans of keyboard cleaner. That would work as well if you don't have an air compressor. For the outside panels of the typewriter, I use WD-40 in this video. I wouldn't do that nowadays. Instead, I would use Simple Green these days just because it's a natural cleaner. I've never had any trouble with it on finishes, especially things like around logos. I would not want to put WD-40 on this logo nowadays, but I would use Simple Green around it. That wasn't too bad. I learned a lot on that project. The platen repair there was the biggest part of that. And it's actually a really valuable skill to have when you are working on typewriters. So I'm glad I know how to do that. And that the information I gave there is pretty accessible still and pretty, it's, it's okay advice. It's not like, worth removing or hiding. So that was me revisiting my first restoration project. I've done a lot more since then. I've really enjoyed restoring typewriters for the most part since that project, but the biggest thing I learned from that project and have found out every single time I attempt a new one is that you can say it's a one day clean and it'll always turn into a week long project. In the case of my Royal 10 Monster, a year long project. <laughs>
If you're interested in more typewriter content, I do have some other videos on this channel, so check some of those out. And I also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter where you can send me questions and I can try to help you find the right place. I want to thank you all so much for watching today and for the last few years. It's been a really fun ride and I'm really enjoying this hobby of mine that's no longer just a class project. And I want to remind you that you're just my type writer.